So first of all, thank you for, to everyone attending this uh, webinar. I'm really looking forward to uh, also getting some questions from the audience. Uh, I've been uh, with the Eurovent Middle East for a, a couple of years now, and I'm also uh, fortunate enough to be on the board of Eurovent Middle East. So uh, really think it's an important association to bring all the different players in the industry together and, and really share our experiences in, in an open way uh, where the focus is really on improving the industry more than uh, just improving our individual companies. My topic for today is looking at how we can save cost in HVAC uh, retrofit projects with active front-end drives. Um, active front-end drives are, uh, are important in that sense that uh, when we do retrofits, the new equipment uh, as drives have a, a tendency to produce some disturbances in the power network and, and we need to deal with that in one way or the other. So, so really the, it's looking at the challenges and requirements, what is the role of variable speed drives in the, in the retrofit projects and then uh, providing a summary at the end. So most HVAC systems have a functional service life of about 15 to 30 years. This also means that all the energy efficiency gains that we've seen in the last years uh, really haven't matured into the ma major part of the building mass, given that these installations are often much older than when we started really talking about significant energy efficiency and, and really pushing that. So I'm sure when you do inspections of the buildings, you'll see a lot of IE1 motors still installed, there'll still be a lot of direct online fans and pumps in the buildings. Uh, and for that reason, it, it makes sense to, to do an evaluation and look at how much could we actually gain. But at the same time, we also need to look at what is the impact of the changes we make, not just on the application itself, but on the power network in the building. So it's a good chance to also improve the system performance. The reaction times on variable speed drives, for instance, is faster than if you have dampers, and that can allow you to modulate much more closely to the uh, desired temperatures and humidity ranges that you're looking for. One of the uh, signals for retrofit uh, need is that energy consumption might start increasing. Their wear and tear of the systems, of course, means that over time, even though it the energy efficiency will decline off a lot of the components. It can also be that the indoor comfort or air quality is starting to see issues. We often see that office spaces, for instance, are overpopulated compared to what they were originally designed for. We find ways to optimize the desk designs so that we can put more people in the same room. Unfortunately, that also means we need a higher air circulation when we have more people in the same room. And a lot of times existing units can't quite cope with that. And there are ways to manage that by doing some upgrades uh, and things like this. And then the increased maintenance cost is the obvious, most obvious sign as you start seeing bearing failures, as you start seeing things that just mysteriously fail. Electronics have a tendency to deteriorate over time. Capacitors, for instance, have a certain lifetime. When that expires, the whole unit will fail in one way or the other. So, so that those are things to definitely look out for. So the retrofit options, of course, depend on the HVAC system design and the installed equipment. Packaged air handling units, boilers and chillers are typically some of the best candidates for a retrofit. And some of the things to consider are the installation of air side economizers, inspection and upgrading of the ductwork ceilings or replacement of the ductwork if it's, if it's really not up to code. Replacing, for instance, reciprocating compressors with more efficient screw or scroll compressors. Um, adding variable speed condenser fans um, is, is another way when you have, if you have fixed speed condenser fans, then you have a higher variation in your, in your temperatures. And by adding variable speed on the condenser side, you can actually also stabilize that adding demand control ventilation. Um, so for instance, using either just simple occupancy sensors, are there any, if there's no one in the room, you don't need to use the capacity in that room, then you can have that capacity available in other parts of the building. Installing uh, 
band speed controls uh, on the supply side, cooling capacity controls. There is, of course, a certain cooling capacity control already, but the older capacity controls were often very highly modulated and, and had a more trapeze form of modulation, whereas the modern uh, modulation is more smooth and thereby also securing a more accurate temperature control. And then, of course, adding smart sensors for temperature, humidity, and also for CO2, so that you have a much more accurate data foundation for the controls that you're applying. Now, drives are often part of an HVAC retrofit project simply because of the fact that the, the majority of the potential energy saving in a building is really utilizing the variable speed properties of a pump and a fan. And by doing that, you can save, depending on the existing installation, in the range 20 to 60% of energy. However, the impact on the network initially, that, that network was initially not planned to have the burden, if you will, of the higher frequency noise that you do see from variable frequency drives. So, so that has to be taken into account when doing a retrofit. Standard drives draw current in a, in a very specific manner because of the rectifier bridge. Those are called harmonic distortions. And that is essentially multiples of the fundamentals. So if you have a 50 Hertz mains network, you will, when you install a variable frequency drive, also be able to see fundamentals of 150 and onwards, multiples of three to the, uh, to the um, fundamental uh, factor. So fifth, seven, 11, 13 harmonics are those that you need to look out for. And we need to manage that. There are ways to do that. We can, of course, just change the system so that the power built, uh, structure in the building can, with, can carry that extra current because it is a load on the electrical installation. Of course, exchanging cables, fuses, disconnects, and transformers in a building is a very costly way of managing a retrofit and it would probably destroy the business case for doing a retrofit in the first place. So the other way is to look at how can we then eliminate these harmonics from entering into the building, looking at various types of harmonics filters that can be passive filters or active filters, or we can look at having drives that actually don't produce these harmonics in the first place which are active front-end drives. Uh, and that is the state of the art today is to have an active rectifier also on your front end. This does affect the drive efficiency a little bit, but at the same time, since you have to deal with the harmonics, it eliminates the efficiency losses that you would have in external filters. So on a total cost evaluation and a total efficiency evaluation, the actual efficiency of the system is actually more or less at par with what you would see. Now, some of the things that you then avoid by do, using active front-end drives is uh, that you, for instance, you don't have to have oversizing of your transformers. So if a transformer is already designed to carry the fundamental load of the building, then with an active front-end drive, you don't have to worry about the transformer because there is no derating of the transformer when using active front-end drives. You don't need to have any external controllers or gateways if you use dedicated HVAC drives. And there are today also dedicated HVAC drives with active front-end. So you can maintain your HVAC functionality and at the same time deal with your harmonics. Also another issue of course is you have an existing building. Quite often the harmonics filters that you need to install would add a lot of space. So, so you need to have space for these panels that then would contain the, uh, the filtering. And in many buildings, we know that the mechanical rooms are kind of squeezed. So getting that space availability can be quite a challenge in many, in, in many buildings. With an active front end drive, it's all inside the same enclosure and you don't have a need for any additional external um, filtering. I hear a lot of complaints from installers that uh, do greenfield projects that the cable quality has deteriorated. They see that the cables are getting warmer and, and they, are, they are more or less accusing the cable manufacturers of making savings. But honestly, if you've got a 1.5 square millimeter cable, it is a 1.5 square millimeter cable. There's no cheating with that. 
The issue is that the lo harmonics load in buildings have increased substantially. When I started in 95, the, in, the use of drives were about 15 to 20% of the load of a building maybe. Today, the load of a building, rectifier load on a building is between 90 and 100%. So the harmonic load in a building is increased substantially. And that's why the cables are getting warmer. It's the added current that is drawn at non-active frequencies. The other thing is if you've got backup generators, that's actually a very important part to pay attention to. If you use a six pulse drive, most of the generator manufacturers have a specific requirement for 40 to 50% derating of your gen set. So if you're moving from direct online control to a variable speed control, you still need to be able to manage the peak efficiency. And that means that your gen set still possibly could be exposed to the full fundamental load. But because you have to derate it, because you're now using six pulse drives, suddenly you only have 50% capacity on your, on, your on your gen set. Then you need to install another gen set in parallel to cope with the load. With an active front end drive, that is also avoided. So, so there are some unique advantages in that you, it's much simpler to do a, a, a retrofit evaluation when you use active front end drives, because all these auxiliary impacts you don't really have to look at because they're not being affected. So in summary, um, retrofit projects, of course, often involve variable frequency drives. Power networks in the buildings may not be able to cope with the VSD load if you're using standard VSDs, because they will have to carry a higher current and upgrading the power network to carry that higher current is very costly. The compactness and, and the properties on towards the power network of active front end drives actually makes it the most optimum solution for HVAC retrofit projects. So, so I do encourage to take that into evaluation at least. The immediate cost of the unit is higher, but then you save all the upgrade costs of the power network, you save a lot of engineering time because you don't have to take into consideration any outside effects on the, the power system. You can worry and focus on the application optimization. And that brought us to the end. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I always, I always uh, think this is very specific uh, when it comes to drives. I'm myself uh, a little bit uh, uh, not spe specialized enough for that. But uh, you say that uh, the uh, you see a lot of troubles with uh, cable warming. Is that yeah. also is it also posing a fire hazard? It can potentially pose a fire hazard. What happens when the cable gets warmer is that, that the, ca the cable actually, the, it's supposed to be a soft uh, insulation on the outside of the cable. But as that heats and, and cools, that gets stiffer and stiffer over time. So potentially you have a risk of the insulation actually starting to crack. If insulation cracks, you've got a short circuit risk. With the short circuit risk also comes, of course, the risk of a fire. So yes, potentially it could. Have I seen examples of it? None that are documented at least. So, so is it a real concern? Maybe not, because the average load on the building is not so high. But still you have to dimension the cables to be able to carry the current. You're not allowed, legally in most countries at least, you're not allowed to take that chance. So, so, so yes, the peak current that you would have is what you need to be sure that the cables are dimensioned for. Mm -hmm. And then if it's not dimensioned for that, you have to exchange the cables. Right. So, so okay. that's really the main, the main yeah. issue is really the, that, that you can't take that chance because there is right. an actual real risk. Does it ever happen? Rarely in HVAC because the average load is maybe 60%. So it's only during peak, which is one to one and a half percent of the operating time. And for that, it would probably not have a long-term effect on the cable quality, at least not for the lifetime of the building.